Russian forces continue their methodical onslaught into Ukrainian positions throughout the line of contact in their war with Ukraine. As we're seeing in, in the last few days, the, the situation in a, an important town called Avdivka continues to deteriorate for the Ukraine side as Russia presses its advantages forward. Let me show you a couple of things about this, about the specific battle, so you'll understand exactly what's going on there and why things are as precarious as they are. And then we're going to transition from the tactical to the strategic, and we're going to tell you what the significance of this one battle is. Uh, and it's a little bit bigger than you may think because of all the other things it's tied into. First of all, I want to show you a quick uh, snippet from uh, the Military Summary Channel, which in my view is the best daily tactical update and has shown itself to be accurate more than any other channel, I think, uh, for at least the last year that I've been watching it. Uh, you can count on and trust what this thing says. Roll the tape. The most important updates are coming from the pro-Ukrainian sources. The pro-Ukrainians confirms the further Russian progress in the central part of Avdiivka, along Donetsk Street, along different streets. And according to information we have from the Ukrainian sources, the Russians are heading in direction of the main supply road, industrial ave that connects the chemical plant and the central part in the southern and the eastern part of Avdiivka. So, uh, when talking about the situation, my first projection, my first understanding of the situation was that the Russian main plan is to was to establish control over this territory. The Russians gonna need to activate their movements on the southwestern direction as well and to at least establish control over something like this. And if the Russians are able to get here, so on the southwestern direction by attacks with also with tanks, with infantry, with convoys, they then this case they gonna uh, will have be able to cut the main supply road that goes from Severne to Avdiivka and the same control the Russians would establish from the north in direction from industrial Ave to the same road and then this is going to be called an, and probably the Russians are planning to implement something like this you can see from from that map right there that they're trying to create a cauldron and if that looks familiar it should because the, the Russians are basically following the same path they did uh, in Bakhmut about a year ago and into the same situation. They crawled up. They, they got the territory on three sides of the city. Uh, then they started methodically shutting down the, the supply corridor, uh, slowly uh, taking first tactical control and then operational control over the supply lines until eventually Ukraine could no longer support themselves. And then they had to withdraw at the last. And uh, right now, the situation is playing itself out in the same way where the the Russians were basically destroying this, as much of the city infrastructure. So there's literally nowhere for the Ukraine side to hide. Uh, and then they're forced into uh, some of the high rise buildings, which uh, I don't remember if this clip we're showing here, if it's going to have it. But basically some of the high rise buildings that they have in Evdivka uh, where it provides. Yeah, there they are right there. So that, that's this could also have been Bakhmut because it looks just the same and with the same kind of results. Uh, you know, I want to now throw up a, a map from the Institute for the Study of War. Uh, which is also reporting these same things. So just in case anybody's wondering if this is just a one-sided deal or just one group, no, this is stuff that's, uh, that's both uh, the Ukraine side, the Russian side, and the American in uh, Institute for the Study of War are all basically saying the same things. And uh, that's, as you see, this is, this is from today, as of uh, information yesterday, the ISW said Russian forces made confirmed gains near Kupiansk, Kremina, Avdivka, and northwest of Bakhmut has continued uh, positional fighting along the entire front line. And on the map on the left there, you actually see the Bakhmut. I don't know if you can see that on your screen there, but right in the middle, there's the outline of the city of Bakhmut, which is in red because Russia still possesses it. Uh, and what you'll see is where the clashes are going on on the left. You'll also notice on both the map on the left and the one on the right, which is Avdivka, and I'll get to that in a second, uh, you see some yellow areas or orange areas on the top, and then you see a couple of blue areas there, not the water, but some of the colored on the map. That The blue area is what Ukraine took over uh, during their offensive, which, you know, they had minimal gains throughout, throughout the, the offensive last summer. And now then the orange areas are areas Russia has recaptured back from the bottom line is that virtually everything the Ukraine side scratched out, as little as it was last year, it's now almost all gone and Russia will then be moving forward. The, the significance of that is much bigger than you may think. It's not merely that Ukraine lost it, but that everything that they did, all the preparation they made, all the thousands upon thousands of, of tanks, artillery pieces, military kit, 
uh, anti-tank weapons, all the things that the, the West gave them, the, the hundreds of thousands of troops that were mobilized for that and were subsequently lost came to nothing. They literally gained nothing, and now then they're losing ground. So just on the surface of it, even without doing any kind of in-depth military analysis, it stands to reason that Ukraine is on a path that will lead to eventual failure and loss in the war. And, and now, and specifically on this town of Abdivka, that's that's taken more hot and concern. Uh, Gary, if you can fill that map back up there, look at the map on the right hand side there. And that's Abdivka, the upper corner. That's that's where we showed the video a second ago. And you again can see growing levels of orange or yellow uh, on either flank of, of the city. And right now there's a large number of Ukrainian troops that are occupying most all of that territory that's that's forming in the cauldron. And, and Russia basically has tactical control over the supply lines as it is. So already they can shoot up nearly anything that gets in there. But if they uh, continue on maybe another kilometer or so, uh, they could literally cut part of that road so that the, they will could be then trapping the Ukraine side in there. And they're going to have to decide probably within a week or two if they're going to continue to fight for nothing or if they're going to withdraw. What they should do is they should withdraw right now because Ukraine has built defensive lines further to the west, about 16, 17 kilometers to the west, where they could reposition their troops today. They could get them out overnight, withdraw the whole thing uh, with a controlled uh, reduction or withdrawal of forces, which is a classic standard military mission. It's something that they should be trained to do, uh, withdrawing under fire and repositioning back where they have actually more uh, control. That's what they ought to do so that they'll save their men. They're not going to save the city. The city, it's, it's, the writing is on the wall. It's already too late. Now, if Ukraine is smart, they'll learn from their mistakes in, in uh, Lysychansk and several Donetsk in 2022, where they lost in similar fashion, or Mariupol, which is one of the first cities that fell uh, when the war started, and of course, Bakhmut. If they learn from those mistakes, then they'll withdraw quickly so they don't sacrifice a bunch of more troops they cannot afford to lose. I doubt they'll do it, though. I just I haven't seen them learn any of these tactical or, strate or even operational lessons. And so I fear that they're simply going to repeat the Bakhmut disaster uh, and then the, the war will continue to move to the west instead of to the east. Um, the, the consequence of this, though, is, is, is compounded because, you know, in the United States, as, as we've talked about many times here, and if you've been watching the news at all, you know that there's a big political uh, fight going on in Washington between the Republicans and the Democrats. And a large section of that is the U.S. border funding for Ukraine and funding for Israel. And the is the fight for Israel has a lot more emotion behind it. So that would actually has a shot at getting passed as a standalone bill. Who knows whether that's going to succeed? That's also up for uh, grabs. But the, the money for Ukraine, uh, according to the, uh, the Speaker of the House, is dead on arrival, as he put it. So the $60 billion the administration wants to give them right now is very much in, in danger uh, and probably won't be passed, at least not anytime soon. We'll see how all that plays out. But it, a lot of people are talking about, especially those who love war, are talking about, okay, if we don't do this, it's going to cause problems for Ukraine, as though if we just keep giving them money, things will go better, which completely contradicts everything that we've seen on the ground for now nearly two full years. You're, we're just about to hit the two-year anniversary of this war, uh, and and. All of the things that I've just showed you and some of these battles I've just mentioned over the last couple of years has come with almost unlimited funding that, that both the West, uh, NATO, European countries, the United States in particular has given and it has not reversed the things, things on the ground. So it's, there should be rationally no expectation that it would that this $60 billion will make any difference than the $200 billion cumulative between the U.S. and Europe uh, has made in the first two years of war. But those facts don't seem to get in the way of some people. And you have this uh, retired general Twitter saying this. If Ukraine goes to the bargaining table or if Ukraine loses this war, you might as well say the U.S. lost the war. NATO has lost this war because remember, we back Ukraine from the beginning in this war. NATO back Ukraine from the beginning of this war. And if we abandon the Ukrainians, then we have lost just as much as the Ukrainians have lost. Okay. <laughs> so many things wrong with that. He implies without directly stating that 
Ukraine is going to lose if they don't get this money. But if we give them the money, then they won't lose. And there is no reason to think that. But again, let me reiterate here and, and make a point of telling you this. We gave unlimited 5,000 total military vehicles, millions of shells, our, our premium air defense systems, artillery, self-propelled artillery, M1 tanks. The British gave Challenger 2s, the, the Germans, the Leopards, uh, uh, French AMX-10 tanks, and, and just thousands of armor personnel carriers from, from all of NATO altogether, uh, as well as billions upon billions of dollars millions of shells of artillery we've given to the Ukraine side. And what has that netted for the first two years of the war? It, you see that line I showed you there. Everything is now slowly and methodically moving to the West. The Ukraine casualties continue to skyrocket and pile up. You, Russian uh, uh, sacrifices and losses are also very high, uh, probably also in the hundreds of thousands. But Russia has millions more military age males from which to draw. Russia has a virtual nonstop military industrial complex that is self-contained. They're getting help from Iran, from North Korea on apparently a sustained level, better than the Ukraine side is getting from the cumulative West, I'll point out. But Russia can do it all on its own. So anything they get from some of their foreign supporters is going to be gravy on top of this. And the Russian community uh, population is completely behind Putin. There is no question about that. Uh, they are prepared to go on this thing for more years if necessary. If this is an attritional warfare fight, which means something slogged out over, you know, hundreds of meters here and there, Russia can do that and they'll win. They, they will. It doesn't matter if we give $60 billion next week and another $60 billion the week after that and another $500 billion in the next couple of years. It won't make any difference. Money's not the problem. You can't fight a war with cash. So the general is wrong. And all those who say that, he's just flat wrong. He's ob obviously wrong. Now, many in the West don't want to uh, contemplate that. They don't want to look actually at what's happening on the ground. And you have a number of people who do that. But not everybody in the West is like that. And in fact, Viktor Orban of Hungary, a NATO ally, says this. <laughs> nyugatiak, hogy a idő az a ő, a mi oldalunkon van. Tehát minél tovább tart a háború, annál inkább javulni fog Ukrajna katonai helyzete. Én meg azt gondolom, hogy ennek az ellenkezője igaz. Azt gondolom, hogy az idő az oroszok oldalán van, és minél tovább tart a háború, annál több ember hal meg, és az erőviszonyok sem fognak Ukrajna javára változni. Akkor miért folytatjuk a háború? Yeah, he's right. Of course, the, the longer this thing goes, as we've said so many times on our channel, the more Ukrainian people will die. It won't change the outcome. And it's and it, Russia is going to continue to advantage. It's going to continue to go to their advantage. I mean, it's just self-evident it is. This is not pro-Russia. This is not anti-Ukraine. It's an, it's an honest evaluation of what's happening on the ground. And the longer our country goes in ignoring these realities, the worse it's going to get for Ukraine. Now, that's from, from our perspective. Now, let's see what it is from the adversary's perspective. Uh, because now a lot of people, they don't want to listen to anything Vladimir Putin says. And I'm going to talk more about that at the end of this video. But we're going to because Vladimir Putin, what he has said over time, has if you've paid attention, none of this stuff will have surprised you. And I'm talking 15 years in the past before this war started. If you'd have been paying attention to what he said, you would not have been surprised that Russia went to war when they did instead of being shocked, like so many NATO uh, leaders claim to have been. So when we hear what Putin is saying here, you always got to take things with a grain of salt, no doubt about that. But when what he says matches what you see on the ground, pay attention like this one. Продолжает. То, что сейчас имеет место быть, а сейчас это совершенно очевидно, не только провалилось их контрнаступление, инициатива полностью находится в руках российских вооруженных сил. Если так будет дальше продолжаться, украинской государственности может быть нанесен невосполнимый, очень серьезный удар. Будет тогда результатом их политики, их правления. So, if things continue on, there's there's no rational reason, any kind of rational reason, save unicorns and rainbows type hope 
that the situation changes. But there's no rational reason to think that. And the longer it goes, the more likely it becomes that Ukraine literally loses the war. Now, the, uh, many of the other one of the other themes that you hear along the West is that, well, Putin is, doesn't even he's not even willing to actually negotiate in any good faith. He, he doesn't want to negotiate anyway. Well, actually, he does. And as you're going to see in the video clip I'm about to play, he explains uh, what they're willing to contemplate. But listen, th th here's another thing. This is not out of the goodness of, of Putin's heart. He's not a good guy because of this. He's very practical. And if there's anything he has shown conclusively since he first came to power, on, I believe it was 1999, is that he's very pragmatic. And he may want a lot of things, but he knows what's possible, what's not possible. And he will be very pragmatic in getting what he needs. So he has motivation to bring this to an end. They don't, the Russian side does not gain by having perpetual war. They don't want it. They showed that they got out of Afghanistan disaster in the 80s after 10 years of war. We waited 20, but that's another point. But they recognized that it was an unwinnable war and eventually just shut it off and took uh, four years to methodically end that war because that's the Russian mentality. They don't want to throw good money after bad. They don't want to keep a bad strategic position. Rep, uh, Putin knows this and he is willing to make a compromise and he's willing to negotiate from a position of strength without question in their advantage and not so much to the Ukraine side. But here's what he says on the strategic level. Мы достигнем своих целей, о которых вы сказали. Теперь вернемся к этим целям. Они не меняются. Вот я напомню, о чем мы тогда говорили. О денацификации Украины, о, о демилитаризации, о ее нейтральном статусе. Теперь, что касается демилитаризации, ну, не хотят договариваться, ну что ж, мы тогда вынуждены принимать другие, в том числе военные меры. Now, if you think, oh, he's just saying that. No, there was teeth behind that in, in uh, April, March uh, of, of 2022 in Istanbul. Putin was willing to negotiate a deal. And the comment that he mentioned there uh, is key where he said, hey, the, a neutral status for Ukraine is one of the important things. That's what he's calling demilitarization, a neutral status so that they don't feel a threat of NATO directly on their on their uh, eastern border on their western border rather and that's what he said in in april of 2022 and now what he's still saying uh right now so there is room for negotiated settlement but folks as i i have been saying since this war started the longer the west and ukraine wait to make a negotiated settlement the worse their deal is going to get the less land that they're going to have and that still holds true just as much right now if, if Zelensky woke up in the morning and said, all right, this is just, I, I, I recognize what Orban sees. I, I recognize what so many of these other people see. I can see from my own maps. I know what's going on. We can't win this. We're not going to get the support from the West and it wouldn't matter anyway. So let's make a negotiated settlement. If he did that, uh, he's, he's never going to get back Crimea. That's obviously off the map. He's probably also never going to get back the Donetsk and the Luhansk. Uh, and these other areas where they've occupied, the Russians are occupied. They're probably not going to get any more of that. But he can hang on to everything else they have right now. On those maps I showed you earlier, all the area that's that's uh, in the Ukraine control can stay in the Ukraine control. So there is a deal to be had right now. And I, I don't know what other terms would go along with it. Probably things that the Ukraine side doesn't like. But the war can come to an end. The destruction of his cities can come to an end. The loss of territory can come to an end. And they can start rebuilding for their future by not losing any more of the natural resource, the human beings, the men that they're going to need to build their future. That's the part that's just anguishing to me beyond anything is because it's not just that people like General Twitter or 20 there are, are blinding themselves and so many others about, no, let's just keep fighting forever because it wounds Russia or some silly thing like that, is you're condemning an entire generation of Ukrainian men to death. And the longer this goes on, the longer into the future it gets before Ukraine has any prospect of actually recovering itself and, and getting back to a healthy state. You're talking decades probably already. And the longer this goes, the longer it's going to take. And it's time to turn that around. Now, uh, the last thing I want to uh, put here is, is something that was released, I believe, just an hour or two ago uh, by Tucker Carlson, because he had something uh, or he's going to have something. He said something today about a, a, a show he's about to have on his uh, X platform, which I'm sure millions of people will be watching. 
Uh, but I want to bring it up because it relates to something we've said in this video right here. Gary, roll that tape. The war in Ukraine is a human disaster. It's left hundreds of thousands of people dead, an entire generation of young Ukrainians, and it's depopulated the largest country in Europe. But the long-term effects are even more profound. This war has utterly reshaped the global military and trade alliances. Most Americans have no idea why Putin invaded Ukraine or what his goals are now. They've never heard his voice. That's wrong. Almost three years ago, the Biden administration illegally spied on our text messages and then leaked the contents to their servants in the news media. They did this in order to stop a Putin interview that we were planning. Last month, we're pretty certain they did exactly the same thing once again. But this time, we came to Moscow anyway. Elon Musk, to his great credit, has promised not to suppress or block this interview once we post it on his platform, X, and we're grateful for that. Western governments, by contrast, will certainly do their best to censor this video on other less principled platforms because that's what they do. They are afraid of information they can't control. But you have no reason to be afraid of it. We are not encouraging you to agree with what Putin may say in this interview, but we are urging you to watch it. And look, that's what we just did. I just played you a couple of clips of, of something that Vladimir Putin has said so that you can understand where they're coming from. And look, if you know anything about military strategy and, and strategic thought, you've probably heard of Sun Tzu, uh, that ancient uh, Chinese philosopher and military uh, strategist, who once famously said, if you don't know yourself and your enemy, uh, you will ha you could lose nearly every battle. If you know yourself and know your enemy, then you need not fear the outcome of any battle. That's what he said. And that's what I have in, uh, embraced throughout my entire military and professional career. If you don't know what your opponent is thinking, if you don't know what they're saying, then you have no idea if your policies themselves are, are even well-crafted, if they have a chance to succeed or not, or if you're leaving money on the table, so to speak. If, if, they, if you listen to what they said, you might see a vulnerability and you can go, I can exploit that by doing this. But if you don't even listen to them, you have no idea. And so you're just shooting into the wind. You're just blindly throwing arrows just kind of in that direction. And you're not going to hit anything. That's the problem with it. And that is the problem here because nobody wants to listen to Putin. But I have listened to Putin. I've been listening to Putin since 2008 specifically. And he has been saying from that time that he has been clearly signaling he would be willing to go to war if Ukraine, if, if NATO came into Ukraine. And the, the closer it got and the more people were talking about it, the more emphatic that he became. And, and, and then when it got even closer, and now you see more American soldiers training Ukraines inside Ukraine. Uh, you had the, the Secretary General of, uh, of, of uh, NATO, Stoltenberg, emphatically as of uh, December or January, uh, uh, right before the war started in 2022, emphatically saying, we stand behind the Bucharest Agreement. We're going to let Ukraine into NATO. Georgia's going to get into NATO. We're still going forward with that. And then Putin finally said, all right, then that's it. We're going to invade. And, and if you had listened to him, you'd know, you would have known that was coming. It was so clear. In the six months prior to that war, I was listening to him and I wrote in the number of public forums that war was coming if we didn't change our path. And in fact, it did come. And now we still have to this day, people continuing to talk about, nope, there's, Ukraine is still going to end up in NATO. That's still going to be. I think it was uh, Secretary Blinken. Uh, just a week ago, made that declaration. Yep, we're still tracking on the 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 fact that Ukraine's going to get into NATO. It, it's just fantasy at this point. But that feeds into the fear of Putin. That's one of the things you got to understand before you make those foolish statements like that, because it feeds into Putin's fear. If he thinks that that's still on your mind, then he's like, why do I want to negotiate? I can negotiate from where the line of contact is right now and probably in the war. But if I think that's still your objective then he's like, maybe I need to go on, even if I have to take another year or two and make sure that we get enough area all the way up to the Dnieper River, perhaps, you know, as far east as they want to get before they get into territory they don't even want to have control over. Then you're going to condemn more people to death. Listen to what they're saying. They will make a negotiated settlement if we make neutrality a part of the deal and we don't bring NATO into Ukraine. So, those are the things that are important. But if you don't listen to your adversary, then you're harming yourself. And I know a lot of people are already up in arms about Tucker. I've seen it many times 
uh, and I've been reading a bunch lately, people are losing their minds because he's gone to Moscow to talk with the enemy and all this kind of thing. He's a, he's a journalist and he's going to put the guy on there and he's probably going to ask him some, I'm sure he's going to ask him some hard questions and people may not like some of the answers and you don't have to agree with anything. And whatever Putin says, uh, you know, you have the freedom to agree with it or not to agree with it. Listen to it though, so that you're informed and you know why you hold the positions that you do. You may find that you learn something useful that can help your side out. I think the process that we've seen in actually record time, first with Finland and now with Sweden, demonstrates that NATO's door is open, remains open, including uh, to Ukraine, which will become a member of NATO. <laughs> I, I, it's embarrassing to watch. Especially in light of the tactical situation I just laid out to you, and how everywhere on the on the on the front is is going against Ukraine, and to simp to make that statement again is it's more embarrassing than it is inaccurate, and it's both. But uh, that's uh, that's where we have for you today. That's your that's your uh, deep dive. Uh, we uh, remain unintimidated and uncompromised for you. Uh, we're going to have some good guests here coming up uh, tomorrow, I believe. Uh, See, I think Chaz Freeman, I think Ambassador Freeman's on tap for tomorrow. Uh, obviously, watch our channel. We're going to promote this stuff. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that uh, because we are unintimidated and uncompromised to bring you the information that you need. Thanks. Like and subscribe, and we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.